Hello again, my creeping army. I know it's been a while, um, that's probably an understatement, uh, but I really do apologize for that. These past few months have been really, really busy and stupidly hectic for me. Um, let's see, I've fully moved out of my parents' house, I've gotten a full-time job, and I'm really just trying to get a hold of my life. Um, now that things are finally settling down, I really do hope to get back into the swing of things again. I did notice that while I was gone, we hit 400 subscribers, which is insane. I honestly never really expected to get that far, but now that we're here, I mean, the only place to go from here is up, right? I am so grateful for every single one of you. Um, I am hoping to get some fresh content out sometime soon, but I hope this little compilation can tide you guys over until I can scrape something together. In any case, I hope you enjoy the video, and always remember, they're just stories, right? Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, uh, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. In the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. And here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched above a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. 
Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Such I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. But we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by the reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore Of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned chair in front of bird, on bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, Fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, What this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, Meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining, with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert island enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token 
of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And that raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted evermore. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthfully how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man, he had never wronged me. He had never given me insult, for his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. It was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out. And then, I thrust in my head. You would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh so cautiously, cautiously for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye, and I did this for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I always found the eye closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who had vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring on how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he had not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, 
You may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped on the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches on the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with this dreadful echo, the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears have ever since been growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, it is merely a cricket, which has made a single chirp. Yes. He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot out from the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but an over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder. Louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now, a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. 
Once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. Then I smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the beat went on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark at midnight. As a bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerfully, they chatted of familiar things. But, ere long, I felt myself getting pale, and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness, until at length I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise rose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chattered pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard. They suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But 
Anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Tear up the planks, here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Thank heaven, the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly I know, I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move as I lie at full length, but no matter, I feel I am better at length. And I rest so composedly now in my bed That any beholder might fancy me dead Might start at beholding me, thinking me dead The moaning and groaning, the sighing and sobbing Are all quieted now With that horrible throbbing at heart Oh, that horrible, horrible throbbing The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain, with the fever called living that burned in my brain. And oh, of all tortures, that torture the worst has abated the terrible torture of thirst. For the naphthalene river of passion accursed, I have drank of a water that quenches all thirst of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring but very few feet underground from a cavern not very far down underground and ah let it never be foolishly said that my room it is gloomy and narrow my bed for a man never slept in a different bed and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses, its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying it fancies, a holier odor about it of pansies, a rosemary odor commingled with pansies with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily, bathing in many, a dream of the truth and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast, deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast, when the light was extinguished, she covered me warm, and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm. And I lie so composedly now in my bed, knowing her love that you fancy me dead. And I rest so contentedly now in my bed, with her love at my breast that you fancy me dead that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all of the many. Stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie. It glows with the light of the love of my Annie. With the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. Once it smiled a silent dell Where the people did not dwell They had gone unto the wars Trusting to the mild-eyed stars 
nightly from their azure towers to keep watch above the flowers in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay and now each visitor must confess the sad valley's restlessness nothing there is motionless Nothing to save the airs that brood over the magic solitude. By no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty Hebrides. By no wind those clouds are driven that rustle throughout the unquiet heaven uneasily from morn till even over the violets that lie in myriad types of the human eye over the lilies that there wave and weep above a nameless grave they wave from out their fragrant tops eternal dew come down in drops they weep from off their delicate stems perennial tears descend in gems Thy soul shall find itself alone Mid dark thoughts of the gray tombstone Not one of all the crowd to pry Into thine hour of secrecy Be silent in that solitude Which is not loneliness for them The spirits of the dead who stood in life Before thee are again in death around thee, and their will shall overshadow thee, be still. The night though clear shall frown, and the stars shall look not down. From their high thrones in heaven, with light like hope to mortals given. But their red orbs without beam, to thy weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which would cling to thee forever. Now are thoughts thou shalt not banish, now are visions never to vanish. From thy spirit shall they pass, no more like dewdrop from the grass. The breeze, the breath of God is still, and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy, yet unbroken, is a symbol and a token, how it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mysteries. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee so that her highborn kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, 
that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea.